Statewide broadcasts of Your Legislators are made possible by the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resources to the latest innovations in corn-based plastics, Minnesota corn farmers are proud to invest in third-party research leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Additional support by Minnesota Farmers Union, standing for agriculture, working for farmers on the web at mfu.org. We welcome you to another session of Your Legislators, a roundtable discussion featuring state lawmakers answering your questions and discussing important issues affecting the citizens of Minnesota. Join the conversation online on Twitter and Facebook. Now here's your moderator for tonight's program, Barry Anderson. Good evening and welcome to this week's version of Your Legislators. We're delighted that you have joined us and we're looking forward to an hour long conversation about the issues of the day. This program belongs to you and so therefore we encourage you to call in with your questions through the various electronic means that will appear at the bottom of your screen. We're delighted that you'll be joining us this week. Now for those of you who tried to join us last week, we weren't here because it was a pledge drive uh, for Pioneer Public Television. Um, that pledge drive continues this week. We now do what we do each week, which is to give our guests an opportunity to introduce themselves before we move on to unraveling the mysteries of St. Paul. And so let's begin with somebody who's been a regular on our program over, uh, over a, a long period of time, uh, Senator Mary Kiffmeyer from District 30 in Big, Big Lake. Senator Kiffmeyer, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Thank you very much, Barry. Glad to be with you this evening. Yes, it is a unique experience uh, to do this by Zoom. I look forward to the in-person. So my district, Center District 30, includes Big Lake, Elk River, Otsego, Albertville, St. Michael, Hanover, and 14 homes in Dayton. And the south part of my district has the Outlet Mall, if that helps orient you to where I'm at. So I'm currently Chair of State Government Policy, Finance, and Elections. And also I serve on the full Finance Committee in the Senate and on Transportation Committee and the Judiciary Committee, which is new for me this year and a variety of other things that I do. My particular areas of interest are elections, of course, but uh, government overall, and in particular, looking out for the people's checkbook out there. You, you have needs to keep your money in your pocket. It isn't always something that government should, uh, should be having. So I respect your checkbook as well. So that's pretty much a, just a quick summary, Barry. Very good, Delight, delighted that you could join us. We go to Representative uh, Patty Akum from uh, District 44B in Minnetonka. Representative Akum, tell the viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you, Barry. Thank you for the invitation to be here with you tonight. Um, I, as you said, I represent House District 44B. That's Min parts of Minnetonka, Plymouth, and the city of Woodland. I'm just starting my, well, I guess it's not just starting. Our session is humming light right along. This is my second term in the Minnesota House. Um, I serve on the Climate and Energy Finance and Policy Committee, the Environment and Natural Resources Finance and Policy Committee, um, Legacy Committee, and also a new committee in the House this year, Preventative Health. Um, I'm also chair of the House Climate Action Caucus. As you can tell by um, some of the committees that I'm on and uh, my interests are in uh, environment and, and climate issues. I think they're really important to our state. Um, and I'm just thrilled to be here tonight. Look forward to the conversation. All right, very good. We're delighted, uh, delighted that you are going to be joining us, that you joined us this evening. Uh, also joining us from District 40, Brooklyn Senator, Senator Chris Eaton. Senator Eaton is originally from Mankato and as viewers, longtime viewers of this program know that when we have somebody from Mankato, we then detour for a 15 minute conversation about all the great things that have happened in Blue Earth County and Maine. Well, we'll skip that tonight. Uh, <laughs> Senator Eaton, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Um, yes, I live in Brooklyn Center. I represent um, Brooklyn Center and the southern half of Brooklyn Park. I've been in the Senate since 2011. Um, and I serve on the um, Health and Human Services uh, Finance and Policy Committee. I also serve on Environment and Natural Resources Finance. And um, I am the minority lead on the 
Human Services um, Licensing Committee. And uh, most of my, I'm a, in my other life, I was a registered nurse. And uh, so that's why I have all the Human Services Committees. But my other interest is in um, climate change and the environment. I, I serve on the Legislative Water Commission and um, often attend the Clean Water Council. All right, very good. Thanks, Senator Eaton. And uh, finally, last but certainly not least, also joining us, uh, Re uh, Representative Peggy Bennett from District 27A, Albert Lee. Representative Bennett, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. And thank you, Barry, for having me on here. This is really going to be fun. Uh, and I am uh, a fourth term representative. I'm a former school teacher. Um, I taught mostly first grade for 33 years in Albert Lee. Uh, also, I represent 27A, which the largest city is Albert Lee, but we go west all the way over to Wells and Keister and kind of northeast up, up to Hayfield and Blooming Prairie as well. So um, in my years of teaching, you know, I, I love kids I, and I grew to love them more even when I was teaching. Um, they're my, they're my kids. They're, I've ha I have over 750 kids. I don't know if anybody can beat that or not. <laughs> uh, they're my family. I keep in touch with a lot of them. They are really why I'm doing what I'm doing right now. I serve on education committees. I'm on K through 12 finance, K through, it's pre-K through 12, really pre-K through 12 policy and early childhood. So I'm really able to focus in and zero in on issues that are important to kids. And um, kids are our future, and I, I want them to have the same opportunities, freedoms, and, and blessings that I've had growing up, and so that's one of my goals. I also have, let's see, some fur kids. I have some cats and a dog, and hopefully they won't interrupt um, my, my speaking tonight because I am at my home office, so. Uh, this is true for all of us. We had a little episode, uh, a fun episode. It was uh, a few uh, weeks ago where... Um, a young man, five or six years old, uh, uh, emulating uh, uh, Star Wars, uh, showed up in the living room of the uh, program. So it was uh, perfect. At least as entertaining as anything we were we were talking about. Yeah. When you, when you talk about teachers and relationships with students, just one very quick story. Um, I had the privilege of visiting Plummer, Minnesota, where the Chief Justice grew up, and uh, her um, her uh, one of her elementary teachers brought the. Um, She'd kept a book with pictures of all the students that she'd had all the years that she'd been a teacher. She was 100 years old at the time. And there was the Chief Justice's picture at five. She wouldn't let us put it on the television. But anyway, that's, that's okay. <laughs> all right, it's, that, that's the kind of relationship that teachers have with their kids. All right, let's talk a little bit about our first issue of the day. Um, and this actually comes from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we're going to start with uh, you, Senator Eaton, because it actually comes from your territory down there. Um, you're originally where, where you're originally from, uh, the Mankato area. Um, the, um, this viewer is, uh, has a place on Lake Washington and is concerned about the condition of the lake, uh, general development lake that's really particularly in the, in the hot months of the summer, uh, turns, turns green and what can we do about saving the, saving lakes in Minnesota and this was a very much an issue that this program spent a great deal of time on in the, uh, second term of, uh, Governor Dayton. We haven't had as much conversation about it, but let's have a little conversation tonight. What, what about, water quality issues and what's going on, if anything, at the legislature about that. Senator Eaton, the floor is yours, and then we'll take it from there. Well, I, I think a lot of the things we're trying to do um, do relate to that because we're trying to find ways to keep the water on the land. And um, we're also uh, trying to find ways to um, divert it because we're having, because of climate change, we're having heavier rains and um, they, and when they do rain, when it does rain, we get a lot all at once. So it tends to wash a lot of the topsoil and so on into the water. So um, the other issues that we're working on is uh, working with farmers to do, to add uh, other crops in with theirs so that um, it holds the, the topsoil. Um, well, I'm putting kerns on between the rows of the crops and things like that. Um, and uh, we're also working on the um, issue of uh, drainage from the highways and the, um, the roads that were upgrading the ponds, the holding ponds and things like that. So it's, 
It's part of the climate change issue. Senator Kiffmeyer, let's go to you and talk a little bit um, uh, about this issue, uh, in part because we had this conversation before when you were with us. Um, there was some robust conversation about um, what do we do, uh, you know, in terms of taking farmland out of uh, production, uh, paying farmers for doing that, and so forth. Talk a little bit about that issue. And I would just note that um, uh, recently had the experience of doing some research in an area where uh, it turns out that uh, the city of New York um, gets its water from the Catskills, and they have a very aggressive program that basically banks land and otherwise uh, pays uh, farmers and others uh, to try to um, avoid um, contaminating water as it is used in New York City. So this is some of the things that we were talking about. Let's talk a little bit about that, if you would, Senator Kiffmeyer. Sure, glad to do that, Barry. I think at that time it was about the buffer strips. And so it was considered a takings of land, productive land for the farmers. And when you do that and you take it out of production and especially the, the bordering of the ditches, the waterways and other things, um, that loss of production, which for farmers, uh, they don't exactly have a large margin anyway to just survive on. So for them, that was a big loss. And that was may, mainly the biggest issue then was those buffer strips and what that actually means. The big thing is that farmers are stewards of the land. They do care about the land already but they also raise the food that we all need and we eat. So we have to balance out um, all of those things and they, they themselves have made tremendous changes over the years. Uh, their conservation practices, they used to plow the ground real nice and clean and neat, but then that led to erosion. So now they're leaving corn stalks and different roughage in there. And then they're planting uh, green cover crops in the fall to help hold down the land. They have done tremendous things already um, in regards to that. We've come a long way, but the big thing is to, to guard against uh, just taking valuable land from people without some compensation. So that's been worked on. But in regards to quote, climate change, I, I read a very neat uh, book a little while ago about uh, climate change and the seven reasons for it. And one of them are sunspots, which we can hardly control the bursts of energy, the sun does not burn evenly. So it has sunspots that come out and send a burst a long way, affects the weather, the jet stream, the ocean currents, there are many things. And then there's the anthropogenic. That means it's caused by human beings, but some of our um, erupting volcanoes will spew more <laughs> into the air um, in just a few days uh, than some of us. But I think we are all working towards having things cleaner all the time. But I think we need to make steady progress and be very careful about some of the mandates that maybe don't affect us, but they affect Senator somebody Kiffmeyer, else. Down the line. You, yes. Is there any, anything in the hopper in the Senate that deals with this issue that you know of in terms of uh, bills specifically dealing with water quality or um, the eminent domain issue that you mentioned, payments to farmers? Or is, is, that, is that topic um, not likely to be addressed this session? It was a hot issue back then, but for right now, I think COVID has taken over of anything at all. It's become COVID all the time, but I have not seen bills. And on the full finance committee, these sorts of things haven't come through yet. Very good. So Representative Akam, your, uh, your thoughts on uh, this question? Well, I think that, you know, as far as things that are happening in the legislature to address water quality, I think there's an environmental or the environment net Environment and Natural Resource Trust Fund bill from last year that never got taken up in the Senate. And so I think there are dozens of different projects that um, would address water quality. And it's unfortunate that the Senate hasn't taken it up yet. We passed it, we passed it in the House last session and we passed it in the House again this session. So it'd be nice if, if they would take that up there. I think in, in Minnesota, we're the land of 10,000 lakes and water quality is something that's important to all of us. And I think that we all need to take responsibility to ensure that we're maintaining good quality. I, I was on the Bowser board um, before coming to the legislature. I was on the Minnetonka City Council. So I was a local government representative on the Bowser board when buffers were in, implemented. And um, it was really implemented to, to ensure that we are protecting our waterways um, throughout our agriculture land. And we're right now, I think at 97% um, uh, a compliance in in the buffers, which is which is a great thing. And so, um, uh, I 
Is there more to do? Absolutely, there, there's more to do. When we look at the water quality of many of our waterways, many of which are impaired, um, we, we need to be looking at why they're, why they're getting impaired and, and what we can do to improve them. And so best thing we can do is to make sure they don't get impaired in the first place. So um, I think that, that um, it's a big issue. And I'm also fortunate to have just been named to the Legislative Water Commission. So I look forward to working with Senator Eaton on that, in that role. Um, I'm going to go back to you, Senator Kiffmeyer, uh, just simply to touch on the question of the, um, uh, the bill that, uh, that uh, Senator Aikum mentioned, uh, uh, asking the Senate to take it up. Do you, do you have any information or news for us to report to uh, our viewers about the status of that discussion? No, I don't. Uh, we are uh, reaching our first deadline, which is all the policy bills. And so um, it's in the wings waiting for some action, but I don't have an update specifically. I will mention though, that in the capital investment bonding bill, every single time we do have a bonding bill, uh, there's a great deal of money put in there for uh, water issues, especially for the small cities or townships or communities that don't have the resources to redo their water treatment systems. Representative Bennett, I didn't want to leave you out of the conversation. Let's talk a little bit about water quality. Obviously, uh, you have constituents for whom that's really important too. And of course, uh, uh, you also, uh, like uh, 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 Senator Kiffmeyer, have uh, re represented a number of uh, farmers as well. Talk to us a little bit about the issue. Yes, and the water quality is absolutely important uh, to me and I know to all of my constituents. And as Senator Kiffmeyer said, you know, when we go out to see the farmers and I go visit many farmers, um, they are some of the best stewards of the land, and I really appreciate what they're doing as they lean, as they learn more of these different um, procedures and protocols that can be done. Uh, they're doing what they can to care for our land and, and take care of it. One big issue in, in the area of Albert Lee is, and I know it's also affecting other uh, small cities, is the um, updates the MPCA is making to the phosphorus um, regulations for our um, sewer and water systems. And the regulations that the PCA is pushing down on the cities is actually going to uh, triple or quadruple our water bills in Albert Lee and in many, many communities. And it just, um, we're, we're trying to figure out how, how can we do this because people can't afford that. And I think we need to be really careful as we go forward that we, um, we always look at a cost benefit. What benefit we, are we getting for the cost? And there, is, um, there are a lot of models, but there's not a lot of um, real proof on what this will actually do the, for the city of Albert Lee to make these huge upgrades that will um, cost people and businesses tremendously and probably force businesses out of our area and into Iowa. So I think we need to look at that as we go forward, always looking at, yes, we want cleaner water, but let's do it in a common sense way. As for the farmers and the buffers, I know we have a bill in the house. I'm hoping it'll get a hearing, um, a bill that would actually pay farmers for that lost land. I think anytime government comes in and takes something, we should be paying for it. So the government should pay for it then. I, if somebody comes and takes over half of my garage, I certainly would expect to get reimbursed for that. So um, that's, that is a bill I know that has been introduced in the house and hoping that it will get a committee hearing there and can move forward. So let's move to some other questions from viewers. We have a viewer from Blaine who wants to talk about the minimum wage issue, which of course has been in the news recently on the federal level. Uh, Minnesota, of course, um, uh, had uh, discussion and uh, some legislation about the minimum wage uh, some years ago, but this viewer is wondering why we don't have uh, a different minimum wage for tipped and untipped uh, uh, employees. Uh, some states have it, some states don't. Uh, it's a controversial question. Um, and whether or not there might be some change in that uh, in this session. So uh, let's, as long as we're, we just finished with you, uh, Representative Bennett, let's go to you again and ask you about uh, the minimum wage and tipped versus untipped uh, employees and what, if anything, might happen there. Well, I know that was a hot, hot topic two years ago. Um, much debate about what to do. And I think you know, whatever government does, we have to be so careful in, in, in placing new rules and regulations, tax changes or whatever, because usually one thing has an unintended consequence and causes something that we don't like. And so with the tipped and untipped, we want to make sure that our um, 
restaurant employees can maintain their jobs. They're getting uh, their, yes, their minimum wage is, is lower, but the amount of tips they get, they actually make really good money. And when we start messing with those things as a government, oftentimes we completely mess it up and ruin it for those people. And so I think we need to be careful as we move forward with whatever we do with that, that we're not, we're not actually hurting the people that we're trying to help. Uh, uh, Senator Eaton, your thoughts on uh, the, the tipping and non-tipped uh, tipped employees and the minimum wage? Well, I think that one of the things you have to be cognizant of is that a lot of the um, tipped employees uh, only get so many hours a week. They Very few of them get full-time hours. So they have to work a lot of them, you know, two or three different tip jobs to try and um, make ends meet. So um, it would be nice if they could get full wages and um, keep their tips and be able to cut down to just one or two jobs. Um, it's not a job that anybody gets rich at. Um, you, you, I have, you don't see any, there, there, haven't, there hasn't been any legislation introduced on this topic in the Senate, I don't believe, so no. far this year. Am I right about that? You're right. Representative Bacon, your thoughts on the tip versus untipped in, uh, employees? Well, I will say as a former tipped um, employee <laughs> from my younger days, um, I, I certainly know the lifestyle of uh, a restaurant worker and know how hard they work. Um, I will say that I think just at, to start the whole conversation off, I think that the notion of a, a living wage is really important and increasing a, a, a wage so that a person can be able to afford a roof over their head and food for their family and some money to put away is really important. Everybody, when they work full time, should be able to afford those things. Um, as far as tipped versus non-tipped, um, and that should be different. I, you know what, I, I just, I, I, I don't think so. I, I think ultimately when it comes down to it, um, are people going to maybe tip diff differently? Maybe they will. Um, I, I just, I don't think that's, I don't think it's as easy to do that as, as it sounds. I don't know where you draw that line. And so I, I have some ambiguity there. Um, I, I certainly understand the conflict. I, I don't, I don't know that I have a clear answer. Um, and um, uh, Senator Kiffmeyer, your thoughts on that question? Well, first of all, those employees who are uh, waitresses and waiters and the work they do is incredible. I, I'm just always amazed, the multitasking and the running around on their feet, keeping track of everything. And, uh, but the tips are always started. You had your base salary and then you did a tip for service above and beyond what was the average. So that was the purpose of tips. And if they do well, it's because they worked hard and they should enjoy those tips. I think in regards to the minimum wage though, um, having lots of uh, kids and grandkids over the years here who are entering the labor force, the employers put a lot of effort into new employees uh, in training them and helping them learn and going through things. So uh, they don't quite get the full measure of the hour that they will from somebody who's been having a little more years of experience. So the minimum wage is meant to be that and generally uh, considered more of an entry wage. Um, but when you have the minimum wage goes up, oftentimes there's a domino effect that the employees above them who are already earning more than that also get a bump in pay. So it has kind of a a rebound effect as you go up. And sometimes the most highest paid employees can benefit more from the increase in the minimum wage than the person who is right there. I just will say though, right now, I'm, um, $15 an hour is fairly common right now uh, because of the shortage of labor. Wages themselves without changing the minimum wage, which is way behind on all of this, uh, the wages themselves right now, because of the shortage of labor, are going up rapidly. And so they're actually being increased just by virtue of the shortage and the market forces that go with them. So let's move to uh, an issue that touches on uh, some of the climate change discussion that we've already had. This is a question that came up a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it is, it is of course, been very much in the news because of the experience in Texas, and that is this question of power generation, electrical generation, and uh, you know the the issue in Texas. Of course, uh, we aren't going to dive uh, deeply into what happened there. We'll leave Texas to figure out what happened in Texas. Uh, but 
it does raise the question about uh, wind power and baseload power. And the Star Tribune, for example, had a piece in the newspaper within the last week about uh, some of um, Xcel Energy's plans relative to um, natural gas backup and so forth. I'd be interested in knowing uh, what the panel thinks about this um, uh, and the balance between wind and solar, which are clearly going to continue to expand and baseload generation, which uh, of course, however it happened and why ever it happened in Texas certainly was an issue there. So let's start with uh, you, Representative uh, Akum. You um, uh, indicated uh, an interest in this topic when we first uh, uh, opened our program this evening. Um, your thoughts on this question? Well, I think our energy generation is incredibly important. And I think that we are in a, in a time of transition. And I think what we saw happen in, in Texas happened for a number of reasons. And, and we're not Texas, so we really should focus on, on here in Minnesota. So um, we are prepared for cold weather here in Minnesota, and we prepare our energy generation um, systems for that. And so um, when it got cold in Texas, it was a lot colder here and our windmills continued to, um, to pump. So I think that we have um, learned how to keep our wind going. Wind is right now the, the cheapest form of new energy, energy generation to produce. And so um, you're right, we're gonna continue to um, expand those areas. And it's important that we do because um, the greenhouse gas emissions that we have from fossil fuel generation are, are harming our planet. And if we're going to be preparing for the future for our children and our grandchildren, we need to be reducing those greenhouse gas emissions and um, continuing to reduce them in the, in the energy sector. And I think that we have um, a lot of innovation going on um, around, especially around storage, battery storage. And there are some of the... Um, uh, uh, great, the, uh, I'm spacing on the name at the moment, but one of the um, unis are, are working on um, long range battery storage capability that's up to 150 hours instead of currently where I think they're just um, like four hours. So I think that will really help us with um, providing some of that base load energy during times of um, uh, weather disturbance and um, and we'll continue to have more, you know, severe storms that will come through our area. So I think that Minnesota is doing really well. I think we can continue to do better. I'm I'm excited that so many of our um, utilities have um, decided that they will be carbon free, or excuse me, um, net carbon zero by 2050. Excel and Minnesota Power and so that's that's great. I think they they recognize the challenge and they know where we need to go and we all need to work together to get there. Senator Kiffmeyer, your thoughts, power generation, baseload power, wind, solar, et cetera. Well, baseload power is absolutely crucial. We found that true in California in a heat wave, Texas in a cold snap here in Minnesota in Princeton, just north of me, uh, they had a shortage and a very bad cold snap and there was a brownout and it was a crisis for the people here. And so we cannot underestimate or take it lightly, the importance of being able to flip on the switch, turn on the heat uh, to take care of such a basic critical human need, uh, whether it's uh, cooler or whether it's warmer. And to do that, multimodal is really the best, having a variety of them. Yes, the, the batteries are coming along, we're not there yet. Uh, the disposal of the windmill blades, which are not recyclable. Uh, there's all the solar panels as well. Uh, the disposal of them, the rare minerals that are being used. This is a way more complex than just uh, talking about the wind and the sunshine. The other thing is nuclear power down in Texas. Uh, it was really great to have that nuclear power. That is really the one carbon free energy that we have, safe and reliable and inexpensive as compared to some of the others. And remembering that wind and solar right now are subsidized, heavily subsidized. And so saying they're the cheapest, if you add back in uh, the cost that would be there, if they weren't subsidized, it would be a little bit different story. But I think having them all, let's give wind and solar the time, let's give them all a source, and some of the electric vehicles get their energy uh, from coal-fired plants uh, because the transmission line isn't exactly 100% one or the other. But let's not take for granted what we have here because 
uh, base power energy is absolutely crucial to us in our lives. Re Representative Bennett, your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Well, I, energy needs to be clean, it needs to be reliable, and it needs to be affordable. And those are, that's a balance that we always have to maintain. Um, I am all for um, continuing our progress toward clean energy. We, I just met with some, uh, a group today that's going to bring in a huge solar farm, you might call it, um, to my area. And I think that's wonderful. At the same time, we need to have a balanced portfolio, as Senator Kiffmeyer said. And one of my favorite things to do is to go talk to what I call the boots on the ground people. And that's the, the people that are um, most knowledgeable and working in the industry. So I spend a lot of time with the Freeborn Mauer co-op people and other energy people just learning about this. And, and they really feel that a balanced portfolio of, of wind, solar, natural gas, some coal, and coal is getting quite clean, by the way, and the way we uh, use it. Um, that's important to have that balance so that we don't have the blackouts and the brownouts that we found California has. Uh, just this winter, not too long ago, the Dakotas had uh, some blackouts and brownouts. We almost had one, I think it was a year ago during our polar vortex in southern Minnesota here, the super cold weather, our windmills, windmills, I shouldn't call, shouldn't call them that, the wind turbines had to be shut down because of the cold. And um, we came very, very close to having brownouts in severe below zero weather. So it's it's a serious thing. It's a, it's a balance. And I think we're, we're moving well with that balance. We shouldn't force it to uh, put our grid at risk and then putting people at risk. Senator Eaton, uh, your thoughts on alternative energy, baseload power, power generation generally? Well, I believe we can be 100% um, on renewables um, very soon in the next few decades. It's, it, there's no reason not to. Um, coal is uh, way too expensive now and it's so dirty. It um, contributes to our uh, problems with carbon in this in the atmosphere and I think that the problem with a lot of the areas is that we're having to adjust our um, energy uh, uh, products to the climate change. Um, Texas had like I think it was 2012 or 2014 when the same thing had happened with all their power uh, their, their uh, power plants were collapsing from the cold and then two or three times more it happened before this time. And they never upgraded them for extreme weather. And because we have a different system where we have a PUC that helps regulate these things and make sure they get done, um, we're at a lot less risk of that. So I would uh, strongly encourage the uh, uh, continued and expanded use of solar and wind Let's talk a little bit about the core function of um, the legislature in, uh, in uh, this year of the biennium, which is, of course, the budget. And uh, there are several aspects of that that are worth discussing. Uh, but let's start with K-12 or pre-K-12 uh, uh, education, what that budget's likely to look like, uh, and um, any other uh, ways in which the legislative process might impact the budget. Let's start with you, Representative Bennett. We'll take advantage of your yours as a teacher, and you tell us what you uh, think we're gonna be doing this year relative to the what I call the K-12, but it's really a pre-K-12 now mm -hmm. budget and uh, any other issues that touch on elementary and secondary education. Right, well, it's a tough one to put out any numbers right now because we haven't received budget targets yet. So we have no idea what the various committees are going to be allowed to, to spend. I can tell you that we have heard um, many, many finance bills, way more than we could ever afford. So there's gonna be a lot of whittling down on what we do. Um, I like to put the, the most amount of our money on um, kind of the basic um, formula, as we call it, for education, which gives schools the most uh, liberality and, and local control and how they spend that money, whether than, rather than trying to um, divide up the money and say, you can use this much for this, this much for that. I'd much rather um, allow our school boards and administrators and parents to make those decisions because they know what's best for the kids. So I'm not really sure what's gonna happen funding wise. I do know, I, I believe we need to be very careful even though we do have a projected surplus now, which I'm very thankful for. Um, but that surplus is really dependent on two things. One is the federal stimulus money and two, 
a lower state spending that's taken place. And that's uh, due to a lot lower education spending with many students um, being homeschooled and private schooled or kindergartners held back for a year. And that's all gonna come back or a lot of it is. Um, and so we need to be really careful I, that we don't bite off more than we can chew. So I, I don't wanna see any new and expensive programs started that are long-term. I wanna see us fund our, our basic uh, formula well. I think the schools need that um, and, and provide the, the most local options that we can. President Aikman, education, K-12. Well, I think that education is one of the most important services that we provide as a state. And I know that the, the, the people in, in my district value our K-12 um, education very strongly. And so I think what I'm hearing from um, my, my families in my district is that um, the schools right now are struggling. I think COVID has been hard on students of all ages and families, frankly. And, and to try and distance learn. And it's great that kids are back in school. I think it's really important. And especially for, for the little ones, the first graders that Representative Bennett used to teach, I think that those young kids need to, that being with their teacher is, um, it's a distance learning. I, I can only imagine for my college age kids, it's a little bit different, even hard on them as well. But I think what I'm hearing right now is that um, our schools need support for summer school to try and make up for some of what's been lost. And so, um, I think that we need to work to partner with them. I believe very strongly that um, districts should be able to kind of help set that up on their own. I, I agree with Representative Bennett about kind of that local control aspect. And, and so I, I really think we need to hear from, from our schools what they need and how we can best do that. And I think that's what's happening in the legislative process right now. But what I'm hearing right, the top one is they need to understand what kind of a partner they can get from the state um, as far as summer school needs. Senator Eaton, education, K-12. Well, uh, let's see. I agree with a lot of what Representative Acom said. I will try not to be repetitive, but it's we need to get the funding going for the uh, summer school. So a lot of kids have lost ground and um, it's an opportunity for them to catch up. Um, I think also that the uh, the funding coming from the last uh, COVID package is um, going to be very helpful to the schools. And we need to make sure all of our educators are uh, vaccinated and so they feel safe in the school setting. Um, I'm concerned about um, the regular testing going on that, um, I mean, I think kids have mostly um, survived the pandemic more than be testing how they, how they learn because they learn different. Um, so I'm not sure how uh, uh, valuable those testing will be. I think they start this week. Oh, very good. Senator Kiffmeyer, education, K-12. Uh, we all realize that absolutely. That's always been a protected area of our budget. Uh, we don't always have the resources to do all they ask for, but they've never been cut. On a rare occasion, there has been a shift. They get all the money but shift it from one biennium to the next uh, so that we can give them uh, as full a measure as we can. I do think that the federal dollars coming in right now, I think there's about $4.1 billion of federal money coming into Minnesota after the most recent 1.9 trillion that has passed and I believe now signed into law by President Biden. So uh, there's a lot of money coming that's gonna undergird some of the actions we do on the general fund. So we need to keep in mind that it's an all funds budget. So it's federal money with general fund money and the per pupil, absolutely the most flexible, the most helpful to school districts. Testing right now, there was a talk for a while that we would not test, uh, which we usually do the MCAs or a variety of other tests, but we need a baseline, we need to know. And also for teachers when they go into summer school to be able to say, okay, here's the gaps, here's where we're at. Then they know where to teach too because they know the issues that are the problem and set the stage for the following year. I see it as a diagnostic, a very helpful thing, not the usual measure of, did you meet the standards which we hope for this year? But we got at least know where we're at so we can go forward in the future. Just to let you know in regards to the COVID, I'm a former registered nurse who served on Health and Human Services for about 12, 14 years. And um, 
The studies have come out showing that children do not transmit like they once thought as far as uh, shedding the COVID virus and the teachers are not as vulnerable to them at all. Matter of fact, to have the kids and all of those, there are ways that they can have classroom in person, uh, but they don't have to have the huge mixing maybe that goes on in the lunch halls or some of the areas. There are ways to do this that they can do it safely and yet get more back in person with the kids need. So, Mary, uh, yes, Mary, go ahead, can I go make ahead. one yes, quick absolutely. additional comment? I just uh, that some of this conversation has sparked something in me that I want to add. And, and one is, I think one of the biggest things that we can do for our students outside of the funding that we're working on is to get them back in school in person full time right now. And, you know, every day that they are out with distance learning is a day of, for most students, great learning loss. And, and we need to get those kids back. It's proven that they can come back safely. So that's important. The other thing I see really important that's outside of funding, but is, is hugely impactful in our committees right now is uh, there is a lot of controversial things floating around trying to be pushed down on our districts from some social studies standards to um, K through 12 comprehensive sex education, things like that. And I think more than ever that uh, parental authority and parental control um, for schools and for our children is really important that the parent is the number one driver of education who's in charge of their child for education. And that's why I've I'm passionate about that local control that I mentioned because parents deserve to be in the driver's seat in education and not, not government so much. So just wanted to add that. Anybody else on education? Anything else? If not, we'll move on to transportation. We have uh, viewers who are concerned about what the transportation budget might look like in this uh, um, uh, budget year. And of course, uh, it also touches a little bit on the climate change question that we also touched off here uh, a little while ago in that one of the principal budget mechanisms for supporting transportation is of course the gas tax. And while electrical vehicles, the, the national percentage is about 1% or, or a little bit less than that. Uh, but as, as those expand, uh, that undercuts the uh, revenue available for transportation. We're not there yet, but it's a long range problem that um, I think viewers are aware of and are also concerned about. So let's talk a little bit about the transportation budget. Let's start with you, Senator Kiffmeyer. Um, where do you see transportation going this year? Any, any points that you can see that are likely to be uh, maybe points of friction or uh, points of development in terms of what we might be doing um, in the next two years? Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Barry. You know, when you talk about friction though, the whole reason for having government is a way to resolve our differences. And so, yes, there's going to be friction because there's going to be differences. And this is a process in a way like Robert's Rules and Mason's that we have in the legislature as well. So it's going to be there. But on transportation, the roads and bridges are used by everybody. And so right now, only a half a percent of the general fund goes to transportation. Most of it is gas tax money. And so fairness in regards to the electric vehicles driving on our roads, many times they are heavier because of their batteries. But their wear and tear in the road is just as much there, but not paying into the gas tax, which is largely what funds our highway user transportation distribution fund. So that's really an important consideration. So we've uh, changed a law a while ago to have some of the sales taxes recovered and go into um, the uh, roads and bridges. And whether it's a small city, and even those people in the inner city, food comes to you from rural Minnesota, is produced and manufactured in many cases in the rural areas, but you need roads in order to get it to the inner city. So you may use the bus there, you may walk, but you still need the roads and transportation to get the goods and services to you. So we're expecting to fund uh, the roads and bridges. Senator Newman, chair of transportation committee in the Senate has talked about uh, leakage from that fund to the tune of about $450 million every two years uh, is leaking out into other things than roads and bridges. And so he has a bill to address that and he said that needs to be changed and wants to at least call attention to it and make sure that when we're paying money into a transportation account, it goes to actually roads and bridges, not fairs, not parades, not other kinds of events that really don't have uh, the direct connection and that's constitutional. So we will fund it as much as we are able to this year because it's the greatest benefit to all of Minnesota. Representative Acom, transportation. Well, I, I, I'm going to focus maybe on the um, climate change aspect of transportation. And I, I think that um, 
transportation, the transportation sector is the right now the highest um, sector of greenhouse gas emissions in, in the state of Minnesota, and I think actually nationwide. And so we need to be working hard to reduce those emissions in transportation. There are some um, efforts going through the legislative process. There's um, a clean fuels bill working to um, promote biofuels. I think there's um, also a lot of interest, especially um, within certain parts of the state about developing more transit. You can't, um, with all the road congestion, I, I live in the suburban part of our community. And so um, certainly understand um, traffic, though it hasn't been that way really in the last year, um, but it'll be back once um, things go back to normal. And so we can't build enough lanes to kind of build our way out of um, congestion. And so finding ways to build out our um, light rail and bus rapid transit, having other modes of transportation available and um, easily accessible for people, I think will be important as we move forward. And certainly I think we need to be working hard on electrification. I'm certainly supportive of the um, clean cars rulemaking that the governor has started. And I think that we in Minnesota, we know that people want to have um, greater access to electric cars and that's what the rulemaking will um, provide. It's not gonna tell anyone that they can't drive their internal, co internal combustion um, car, they can, they can still drive them um, and they can still buy them. And it's just providing more options for those people who would like them. Uh, I was in the market for an electric car last year and had trouble finding them in Minnesota. And so this will help um, trigger our auto dealers to be um, providing options, more options for Minnesotans. And so um, I, I look at it as as we need to be doing better to electrify. And I do think you, you brought up a great um, uh, issue that needs to be resolved and that's how do we transform our funding mechanisms for um, maintaining our roads and bridges and our transportation system. And if gas is um, going to be less the, the way of the future, then we certainly need to figure out um, what that mechanism will look like. Uh, yes, Representative Bennett, transportation. Well, transportation is obviously an important um, function of government that, you know, our roads and bridges are our infrastructure. It affects the, the entire state and our economy and everything. I would agree with uh, Senator Kiffmeyer on uh, the, the gas tax. And, and actually, we had created a, a special tax, taking the taxes on car parts and purchasing of tires and things, putting that in a special fund to be used for roads and bridges. I think we need to explore funding like that. The, the gas tax is actually kind of antiquated. And as we get more and more electric vehicles, as the other members were talking about, um, that use less gasoline, we really can't rely on the gas tax for all of our needs. So I think um, utilizing some of those other taxes is a good way to do it rather than raising that gas tax even more. The other issue I'd like to touch on is um, what Representative Acom mentioned, the, the clean cars rule that the MPCA is making right now. And I, I actually look at that as, as not a good fix at all. That clean cars rule, um, I call it the California car mandate actually. Um, so the governor and the MPCA are doing rulemaking outside of the legislature, um, kind of an end around the legislature. So it's not going through the normal committee process where it gets aired and, and debated. Um, they're making a rule that will put us under the authority of a California regulatory board um, on, on our car, car emissions, the vehicle emissions, and so on. And for our dealerships along the border here in southern Minnesota, uh, my dealers in Albert Lee and Austin and, and the other areas, this is really going to hurt them because they're going to have to keep cars on their lots that people aren't buying in, in uh, rural Minnesota because the electric cars for, for our area don't work well, uh, nor does all the transit. Um, and the, the costs of our regular vehicles are going to go up tremendously. What's going to happen for those car dealers is people are going to go across the border and purchase their, their cars in Iowa where they can get them for $1,000 or $2,000 cheaper than they can in Minnesota. So that's one of the unintended consequences of government actions that I see happening. When you look at the, the amount of, we all want clean air and, and less carbon emissions, but when you look at that, um, what, what the proponents of this bill are saying is a, it would reduce our carbon emissions by two 2 million tons a year 
But when you think about the world emissions um, in 2019, um, there were 36 billion tons of carbon put out. So the amount, the, the cost and benefit of that is, is nothing. We need to be doing other things to lower our, our emissions um, than, than forcing dealers to carry certain cars and forcing mandates that are going to drive us out of the vehicles we want to buy and use in rural Minnesota and um, leave us without options. All right. Um, we, um, anything else on transportation? We move, oh yes, uh, Senator Eaton, go ahead. Thank you. Um, well, I have to um, disagree with um, Representative Bennett. Um, there's no mandate. Points. This is one of these friction points that Senator Kiffmeyer was talking about, right? <laughs> yes. There, go, there go is ahead, no Senator. mandate. No mandate in the clean cars um, bill, our rulemaking. Uh, nobody has to buy them. No dealer has to have them. Um, it just makes them um, more uh, attractive. And the gas issue is, is more to do with the fact that all of our cars get better gas mileage. So nobody's buying as much gas. So it's because not that many people have electric cars yet to impact it that much. It's mostly the fact that, um, you know, very few cars get, get less than 20 miles to the gallon right now. And it's, that used to be very rare. Um, so we, knew need, we do need to find another funding, but uh, um, emissions are crucial, especially to people who live in poverty or people of color who live in the areas next to the roads. They're getting a lot of emissions from the highways and from the cars. And it's really important that we start to um, clean that up. Some of it by electric buses, if the city buses and uh, the semis or the bigger trucks on the road were electric, that would certainly make a difference. The cleaner diesel uh, that we've converted some of them to um, through the uh, VW um, monies is, has been very helpful. But um, it is one of the biggest uh, pollution emissions that we have is transportation. And we don't spend enough money on it. Um, there, we haven't had a true transportation bill since I've been in the Senate. And I've been there since 2011. So um, just ask Senator Scott Dibble, who's the minority lead on transportation. It's very frustrating. So let's talk a little bit about, we only got about four minutes left. Let's talk a little bit about higher education and where that might be going. Uh, and Representative Acom, let's talk a little bit about uh, what you see happening on the higher education side. Well, I think that at, speaking for a parent of two um, boys in college, um, college is incredibly expensive and um, only becoming more unaffordable all the time. I think that um, we need to be working to ensure that when young people graduate from college, they aren't so burdened with college debt that um, they can't afford to um, you know, buy a home or, or transition into that next um, stage of life because they're so um, stuck paying back student loans. And so um, I think that there are different um, different ways we could go about that. It can be encouraging, um, you know, lower cost um, options. And we have some, some really great options that I think aren't um, utilized enough in our trade schools. And, and we need to encourage, um, uh, in our high schools, we need to encourage um, kids to look at lo lots of different choices. It doesn't all have to be four-year schools. And so I think that we just need to work to make sure they aren't graduating with so much debt. So uh, Representative Bennett, your thoughts on the higher education budget in this session? Yeah, it's funny you'd ask that because I just had a meeting today with our uh, one of my local state colleges, Riverland Community College, and which has a campus in Austin, Albert Lee in Austin. And they are doing amazing work educating our kids and, and bringing in the trades and trying to meet the needs of, of our, our businesses that are crying out for welders and electricians and and carpenters and computer programmers and all those things. So I just want to give a shout out to our state colleges and the work that they're doing. And also the work they're doing, I'm focusing on more pre-K through 12 in my committees. And yet there's that merging um, when you get to the secondary level where we've got PSEO where students are able to go to these state colleges while they're in high school and get a lot of their classwork done. And that's one way I think we can um, encourage some cost savings 
when we're looking at the budget, I think we really need to look at what is driving up the cost of, um, of education in our, our colleges and universities. Um, if you look at inflation, <clears throat> I can't remember the number, but it, it's something like it's inflated at least maybe 20 times higher than any other thing, you know, the inflation of the price of a car, that kind of thing. So we've got to get a handle on what is driving up the cost of colleges and at the same time, make sure that it is affordable for these young people. And I think it's going to be a multifaceted uh, kind of approach to, to fix that. Senator Kiffmeyer, uh, about 30 seconds or so, fix higher education for us, if you would, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> One thing you'll find is that we have a grandson who uh, graduated with a two-year degree in diesel mechanics and started out uh, at a salary of 60000 a year, able to buy his first home and has great benefits. So. I think the idea of having our four-year colleges, I think they need to change. They've been kind of focused on a certain thing in a certain way and doing this stuff. They haven't changed. They haven't reformed their structure. They're losing students. And tech schools working together with them could have a two-year, four-year pathway and much cheaper. Sen Senator Eaton, we're just going to give you about 15 seconds. Education, your last word. Well, I think we need to cut the cost of education for our students. A lot of them come out with so much debt they can't afford to buy a home or a car or raise a family. So we've got to find a way to make it less expensive. I, uh, with that thought, I'm going to thank our panel for your help this evening. I want to thank our viewers for joining us and for providing so many great questions for our panel to consider. I want to remind everybody that we will be back here next week and every week that follows until the legislature goes home. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Yep. There's much more about your legislators online at pioneer.org slash your legislators. Find out more about the history of the program, who has been a guest, and watch past episodes and discussions by topic. To continue the conversation, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resources to the latest innovations in corn-based plastics, Minnesota corn farmers are proud to invest in third-party research, leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Additional support by Minnesota Farmers Union, standing for agriculture, working for farmers on the web at mfu.org.